it's good to see son of our congregation, Brandon, back visiting us today from South Carolina. And uh, I'm sure he has many good things to say about the church down in West Columbia. I uh, had the honor of hosting your pastor, Pastor Pfeiffer, at our house uh, a couple of weeks ago on his way taking his two oldest sons up to Manuel Lutheran High School. And uh, then on the way back, they stopped again, and we again had the honor of hosting them. So he said everything was godly down there and at uh, Holy Trinity. And I'll be going down there for a pastoral conference in a couple of weeks. Our regional, Southeast Region Pastoral Conference will be down there uh, last week of September, of which I am the humble chairman. So, uh, hope work is going well for you down there. Are you president of the company yet? No, not You're getting there, right? Okay. Is that a private? Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, just uh, I was kind of catching me off guard you know, all the different uh, <clears throat> the different Bibles that we use. Oh, yeah. Well, all right. Since you brought it up, I'll I'll give you my my short speech on that. Why do we use the King James here? A lot of people say, "Oh, it's old hat. It's old English. Hard to understand." Well, first of all, a study was done a few years ago. Uh, just how hard to understand is the, is the King James. Linguistic experts tested it and found out a sixth grader with a sixth grade education could understand it. So it's not that hard. There's a few words, the meanings have changed, but not many. And uh, if you study it closely and carefully as we do here, it's very clear. But the main thing is, did you know, you know, after, uh, after the apostle, who was the last apostle to die? John. John, very good. He was the youngest of the apostles. He died about 100 A.D. So the apostles are gone. Jesus has ascended visibly into heaven. Where do we go from here? Well, there was the next generation of Christ believers, the people who knew the apostles, people by the name of like Irenaeus and Polycarp and so forth, lots of them. We have their writings. And the Bible itself, the New Testament, uh, tells us to be, be aware of false prophets that will arise even out of the visible church. And these, these faithful apostolic followers in the, in the next generations in the, what you'd call the second century A.D., they, they had a rough time of it because there was always heretics rising up in the churches. And they had to, they had to fight them. And we have their, their letters. We have their, their writings. And uh, y- you know what these heretics tried to do? Well, you know where the Bible, the New Testament, came from. We have the writings of the apostles, and to get into the sacred scriptures, it had to come from the hand of an apostle, as Jesus commanded. That's what the apostles were for. So once the apostles had died, the New Testament was shut, it was closed, and we had their writings, and their, their writings were copied all over the Mediterranean world at the various churches. Very carefully, the Christians would copy word for word from the originals, original writings, the letters of Paul and Peter and John and so forth, and the Gospels and Acts and Revelation. All these writings that make up the 27 books of the New Testament were copied by hand, because there was no printing press, there was no copy machines. And so they, they made hundreds and hundreds of copies. And we have a lot of those to this day. 
as, as the centuries went on, more and more copies were made up until almost 1500 AD when Gutenberg invented the movable type printing press and then everything was printed from then on. But up until then it was all copied and you gotta be very careful when you're copying things to copy it exactly. And the Christians, the true Christians, were very careful about this. And we have literally thousands of those manuscripts. We well, can compare them and they agree 99.99% of the time. But these people like Irenaeus and Polycarp and so forth, they started writing about how there were some heretics in the church that started deliberately miscopying certain verses and words and passages of the New Testament. And we have some of those documents too down to this day. Now, up until around the year 1875, there was no dispute as to what the New Testament text was. Because we had thousands of manuscripts that, that showed it. It's the base of it on. God had miraculously preserved the Bible down almost 1900 years. But then two guys named Westcott and Hort came along in the late 1800s, and they said, oh, we've, we've decided that what we've accepted as the biblical text in Greek of the New Testament isn't quite right. That some of these other manuscripts from way back are really better manuscripts. And so they changed the Greek text, what's called the Textus Receptus. They changed that. They started changing the New Testament. And then came out the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, based on the Westcott and Hort manuscript. And then we started this flood of new Bibles, all based on these new texts that had never been considered true before, but now all of a sudden we go back and we say, oh, I, I think what, what they wrote way back then, that was even a better text than what we've always had. We should have followed these other two ancient manuscripts. Well, these other two ancient manuscripts that they're now using were written by heretics. And Irenaeus and Polycarp and all those other guys said so. They fought them back then. He said, this isn't, they're, 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 they're changing the Bible. Well, now they're coming back. And they're, they're entering into all these new modern, modern translations. Now, who do you think's behind that? The devil. the devil. Now, they fought it in the early eras of the New Testament age. But now the churches are just giving in to it. West Cotton Hort must be right. And those Bibles we used before 1880 and 90, they were wrong. But now we got the right ones. And so you'll see in a lot of these modern translations, footnotes. Never had footnotes in the Bible before. Now we have footnotes. These footnotes say things like this. Other manuscripts say this. I know up here it says that, but other manuscripts say this. So they're bringing all these heretical manuscripts now and giving them, giving them uh, some prestige. Manuscripts that have been rejected by the church for centuries are now taking precedence over those thousands of other manuscripts that we used for all those thousands of years, or you know, hundreds of years. In your thought, as to why churches are adopting that, changing, what do they, what do they see as the value? In doing well, that? two things, Daryl. Good question. First of all, it's under the disguise, and, and Satan disguises. He uses smoke screens to work behind, you know, so you don't really see what he's doing. The smoke screen they use is, but King James is hard to understand. We need something in modern English. That's the smoke screen. And everybody is sitting there, oh yeah, yeah, we, 
We, we want something in, in modern English. Take out the these and the thous. We, we, those are too hard for us. She'd probably read the these and thous for many years in her life and thought nothing of it. But now somebody has come along and deceived her. Uh, these and thous you can't understand. Well, I, I, if I may interrupt, Brandon, I, I don't want to say that all the new translations are totally wrong. Okay, like I say, all the manuscripts we have, even these spurious ones, agree 99.99% of the time. But you have to be careful when you have a translation, because a translation means you're kind of dependent on the translator mm -hmm. and his beliefs. And if his beliefs are heterodox, that's going to creep in to his translation. Yeah. Whereas the King James was translated by a hundred scholars in England back in the early 1600s who were chosen by the king himself to be the best scholars in the world at that time. And there weren't a hundred different denominations then. And these guys worked at it for years, translating the New King or the King James. And it was the accepted best English translation based on the best manuscripts for hundreds of years, up until the late, well, about 1900. That was the Bible. It was called the Authorized Version, the King James, the AV. It was the one authorized by the church as the English translation. But then all of a sudden, 1900, you get the RSV coming in. And then started the floodgates with all the new translations, the Living Bible and all this stuff, which were nothing more than uh, various denominations coming in with their own little twist to it. If Satan can't defeat Jesus Christ, which he tried to do. Well, he couldn't do that, so what's the next best thing? Let's get rid of the Bible. It tells us about Jesus Christ. And I think in these latter days, that's what's going on. So I, uh, I don't go along with these new translations for that reason. That's number one. Uh, the smokescreen Satan uses to get him in is it's easier to understand. Well, let's, let's face it. The Bible in a lot of places is not easy to understand. And if you're making it all easy to understand, then you're changing something. It's not meant to be easy to understand. As we have already seen in chapter 4 of Mark, it talks about the mysteries and the secrets. And we're going to see more of that as we go along. It takes study. It takes time. It's not an easy book. It's God speaking, not some man. So it's meant to be studied, and it's meant to be taught correctly by learned people who have studied it carefully, like pastors in our, in our synod. That's the first reason, the smoke screen. King James, hard to understand. Second reason is, Westcott and Hort became very highly respected among academic circles. Like, oh, they're going to give us the real truth now. They're the, the scholars. 
So if we want to be scholarly and academic, we've got to go along with them. That was another trick of Satan. Academicians, scholars. Oh, we've got to respect them. Even though they came up with dragging in these two spurious manuscripts. So they, uh, anyway, they came up with what's called the historical critical method, which is critical of the Bible. Especially the text, the Textus Receptus. Uh, that was used up until 1900. Now, one other note in regard to translations into English, I think the New King James is the second best. And a lot of our churches use the New King James. I know down at the church I go to in Florida when I'm down there, uses the New King James. The New King James tried to do what all these others said they were doing. Take the King James and just take out the these and the thous. <laughs> Don't change anything else. Use the Textus Receptus as the basis and just modernize the language, the English, just a little bit. And I think they did a very good job of it. So I, I look at the, the NKJV as second best. But I still like the good old King James, the one that's been around since 1604, I think it is. Uh, it's served us well for centuries and uh, the, in the Bible, God says, my word shall never pass away. Well, if Westcott and Hart were right, it passed away. It passed away for hundreds and hundreds of years. So you see, that alone tells us they're wrong. God wouldn't let it, the truth of his word pass away for centuries, and all of a sudden, uh, in 1900 A.D., oh, now we have the real Bible. I think it's more like Satan's work. Uh, trying to pervert the Bible in the latter days. So that's, I think, where it's at. I think if people really got behind and studied where these new translations are coming from, and if they're really concerned about having the true word of God, they wouldn't be flocking after all these new translations. But people are ignorant. People, by and large, don't even go to church anymore, so they're totally ignorant. And the ones who do go to church, they're ignorant of how we got the Bible, where it came from. Uh, and they're, they're going to go along with what their denomination tells them, what their local pastor tells them. Well, I am your pastor. You've called me to be your pastor, and I'm thankful for that. But I'm responsible for my sheep. And I'm going to not try to feed you anything that's not good. I'm going to give you the best food. And I think the best food is found right here in the King James English. And if the King James English, I think, varies a little bit in its translation, I'll tell you. Because I also know the Greek. Okay? But I think in the end, that's, that's the important thing in our Senate. All of our pastors know Greek. The, the, the Koine Greek that the New Testament was written in by the apostles. And they can point out any flaws in these new translations. So I'm not going to condemn them for using them. But uh, for my flock, I'm going to use the best. You know, there's good, better, and best. Well, I want the best for my flock. So that's why we stick with the King James. And I think that you guys are smart enough to know what thee means and what thou means. And when a word ends with an S-T, you can figure it out. <laughs> thou knowest all things. I think you can figure out what that means. Stuff like that. Okay, we're in Mark 4. And here we have this wonderful chapter of the Bible where the Gospel of Mark enters into, first of all, four parables. And the first is the great parable of the different soils. And we've studied it. And then we've looked at uh, the next parable, the candle under the bushel. 
And uh, then we come down to the third parable in Everybody getting to Mark 4? Verse 26 starts the third parable. And uh, so let's go to verse 26. And he said, of course, he being Jesus, so is the kingdom of God. So he's going to compare the kingdom of God to something. The kingdom of God is like this. Uh, He ought to know it's his kingdom. He's God. So he's going to teach us in very simple terms, a simple little uh, comparison, what is the kingdom of God like? Well, the kingdom of God is the Holy Christian Church. It's the communion of saints. It's the sum total of all true believers, people who've been truly converted and are still converted, whether they're in heaven or on earth. That's, That's the kingdom of God. As I pointed out, the last words of this parable, the last words of verse 29... Because the harvest is come, that is also the kingdom of God. Okay, so he uses this example of of farming, of agriculture. A farmer goes out and he plants seeds in the spring, and then he just sits around doing a lot of other different things while those little seeds are producing this great harvest out in his field. And... uh, The whole thing is about the harvest. Everything in agriculture is about the harvest. If there's no harvest, why bother? Well, that's the way it is with God. He wants a harvest out of this world. He's he's allowing this world to exist, even though it's full of sin. He's allowing it to go on so that he can get a harvest out of it. And that harvest is the kingdom of God. And it's like this. It starts with a seed, and it grows, and then he harvests it. And what's the seed? The Word of God, the Bible, in our day and age. That's the seed. And so Jesus says, So the kingdom of God is as if a man should cast seed into the ground. The man being anybody who spreads the true word of God. And it's not his seed, it's God's seed. God makes the seed and God makes his word. Now, we don't want to pervert it. Now, Terry has brought it up as we studied this verse, a very good point. Well, the farmer does something. Didn't you say that? Yes. Yeah. What does the farmer do? Well, he spends all winter trying to make sure that when he gets out in the field in the spring, he's got what? What kind of seed? No seed. Well, okay, but the best seed, you said. He studies the different hybrids. He studies all these uh, results from all these uh, seed companies. He wants the best seed because he knows that'll produce the best harvest. So, yeah, he does that. Before he sows the seed, he wants to make sure the seed is the best. What does that tell us in regard to this parable? Remember, what is the seed in the parable? The word of God. So as you men, generic, go out and sow the seed, as you go out and spread the word of God, you want to make sure it's what? The true word of God, not some lesser seed. Not just part of the word of God or a perversion of the word of God or something added to the word of God, but from man's own skull. You don't want a a corrupted seed. You want pure seed. So that's our job. To make sure, like we just discussed, we got the right translation, and that we're teaching it truthfully, as it says when we go out and cast it when we go out and preach and teach it and disseminate it. We don't want some of the word of God mixed in with human error, with human opinion, with human bias, 
with sinful reason. We want the pure word of God. We want the best seed. Yeah, we're like farmers in that regard. We want the best seed. We don't want from some heterodox church where they've got some of the truth, but they've got some errors too. That's not good seed. Okay, so a man, he casts seed into the ground. What's the ground? Ground represent, is represented by what? Or what? Ground represents what? People, human beings, Adam and Eve on down. Okay, that's just like the first parable. You know, the four different kinds of, of ground. The hard path, the, the stony ground, the weedy ground, so forth. Okay, so that's very similar to the first parable in this chapter. Okay? So here's how God brings forth the kingdom of God, his harvest. He's got his ground, and that's the world full of people. And he casts his seed onto it, which is his word, the Holy Scriptures. And then what happens? The same thing that happens in a farmer's field. Miraculously, what happens in about a few days? You see little green shoots coming up all over the field. And you go on to the next verse. This man, this farmer, verse 27, he should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. Isn't that true? The farmer, does he know how that little seed little seed, produces this little green shoot coming up out of the ground and then start to leave, as he describes in the next verse. And then the full corn in the ear. He doesn't know how that happens. He just knows it does. And it happens year after year after year after year. So he keeps doing it. It works. He doesn't know how it works. Not even a, the, the most brilliant scientist knows how it works. All we know is that life comes from seeds. If you don't have seeds, you don't have life, whether it's human beings or animals or plants. That's God's plan all the way back to the book of Genesis when he created us, this whole universe. So one of the main lessons here in this parable that Jesus is saying is the kingdom of God grows because of the word of God being spread and taught in the world. But we don't know how that happens. Man, it has nothing to do with man's doing it. No more than the farmer has anything to do with the little shoots coming out of the ground. That's all God's doing. The kingdom of God is built by God. The Holy Christian Church is God's creation, not ours. We didn't bring ourselves to faith, and we don't bring anybody else to faith. God, the Holy Ghost, does that. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the Communion of Saints, Apostles' Creed. The Holy Christian Church, faith exists in this world, true saving faith. The kingdom of God exists because of the Holy Ghost working through the Word of God and its visible forms, baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's why the church exists. It's not our doing, it's not our creation. That's what Jesus is teaching in this parable. Okay? Now I want to get down to verse 27 and look at it in detail. Okay, uh, the farmer, the man, he sleeps. He's not responsible for going out there and forming every little green shoot. That happens, as Jesus says here, of itself. But he sleeps... Uh, and he rises night and day. He sleeps and rises, sleeps and rises, sleeps and rises, night and day, night and day. And the seed should spring and grow up while he's doing this stuff. He knoweth not how. Okay, he, it's, it, the seed does what? It springs. It sprouts. Out of this little dead seed, buried in the ground, a little green shoot comes out of it springs, and then it grows. 
What is happening? What is happening here? In one word, what is happening? Life. life. Spring and grow. That's life. And the life is in the what? It's in the seed. It's not in the ground. The ground's dead. And the ground represents what? People. People. You're dead to God. You're, you're dead by nature. All you can do is sin against God. You can't bring forth life. Life comes when you're born again. Life comes when you're converted, when you're uh, regenerated, when you're brought to faith by God the Holy Ghost. Then you spring and start to grow in the eyes of Almighty God. Okay, but it's in the seed, and the seed is God's word. This is why we call the Bible the word of life. It brings people to life, this message, this word. And it has the power also to grow. Once a person is converted and springs, he stays in this word of God, hopefully, and then his, his faith will continue to grow unto maturity, the harvest in heaven. Does man have anything to do with this? Does the farmer have anything to do with this? No, the point Jesus is making in the parable is, no, it has nothing to do with the man. After he's cast the seed, which he didn't make, he just sleeps, rises, sleeps, rises. He goes about his other chores while the seed is out there doing its work in his field. That's God. God builds his church. Jesus said, I will build my church in Matthew 16, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. All man can do is cast seed into the ground in the previous verse. The seed by itself does all the rest. What a marvelous wonder a seed is. And how thoughtlessly humans handle it and take it for granted. It is a miracle of God, just like the Bible is a miracle of God. And see how humans thoroughly mishandle the Bible, too. Take it for granted. But for growth to take place, for life to take place, for eternal life to take place, the word must be cast into men's souls. It must lodge there, and then that soul comes to spiritual life by the living word of God. This is how conversion takes place. This is how a child of Satan is changed into a child of God. A Saul is changed into a Paul, and so forth. It is the seed alone, the seed that has life and grows, not the ground. Our heart is but the soil, nothing more. Not even the best farmer makes the seed grow. Once he's planted it, he's done. It does it by itself. All he can do is sow the seed and then patiently wait. What does that tell us? We need to be patient. We say, oh, we wish, I wish my church was bigger. I wish there was more believers in my life. Well, be patient. Just keep sowing the seed and wait. It's up to God. Don't worry about it. God's will will be done. He promises that. I will build my church, Jesus said. But we need to be like the farmer and be patient. I imagine uh, it's kind of hard for farmers. You know, they get that seed out there in the spring, and then they've got to wait all summer. And they're worried about the rain. They're worried about the drought. They're worried about the weather. They're worried about the insects and the, the weeds. And, you know. But they can, all they can do is wait. And so that's all we can do. We sow the seed. We make sure it's good seed. We keep true doctrine based only on scripture. We sow it, and then we say, it's up to God what happens. And we patiently wait. So the seed, as it says here, verse 28, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. It has nothing to do with the man. Man doesn't form each bean plant or each corn plant. 
or radish plant or whatever you have. It does it of herself, that is, of God. It's really not the, the, the ground and the seed that bring forth the plant, it's God, because that's the way he made it. He made it so, he created it that way. So it's all God. So this is the working of the kingdom of God. This is how it happens. Jesus is teaching us here, and this is how the kingdom of God comes about. A farmer simply sows good seed into his field, and then he sleeps and rises night and day, doing his other work and following his usual routine of living. And he leaves it up to God to make the seed grow. It's all God's doing. You remember what God said after the flood? Go back to Genesis 8. God destroyed the world with a great worldwide flood. Only eight human beings survived it. And uh, the flood occurs in Genesis 7, and then what happened after the flood occurs in Genesis 8. And I want to look at Genesis 8, and uh, verse 15, God said and uh, spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. So he said, now, now you can get out of the ark. The, the flood is dried up enough that there's some dry land to get out there onto the land. Okay. And so in verse 18, Noah went forth. And so in verse 19, all the beasts that were in the ark went out onto the ground too. What's the first thing uh, Noah did in verse 20? He built a church and worshiped God and made sacrifices of thanksgiving, reminding him also the coming sacrifice of the Messiah, the Savior. And in verse 21, the Lord smelled a sweet savor. He smelled the sacrifice that uh, Noah made. He liked it. The Lord liked this, remembering how the Messiah would come and give his life a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I have done. Now look at verse 22. While the earth remaineth, Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Who's in control of all those things? God. He says, I control, I control summer and winter. I control day and night. I control cold and heat. I control seed time and harvest. Not the farmer. Farmer just does what is there by God's doing. But he promises, I will not destroy the world anymore until the end of the world. And until that day, the last day, the day of judgment, seed time and harvest will continue. So he's saying right there, I'm the one in charge of seeds growing into harvest. Not man, God. You remember also later on in the book of Genesis, uh, Joseph was in Egypt, and uh, Pharaoh had a dream about seven lean cows and seven fat cows and all that, you know, how the lean cows ate up the fat cows. And Joseph interpreted the dream, and he said, God is telling you this. What? Now, first you'll have seven bumper crop years. And then you're going to have seven drought years of no crop at all. You think Pharaoh could have said, well, well, well we can control that, you know, we'll, we'll see that that doesn't happen. No, it happened exactly as God told him in the dream. There were seven years of plenty, and then seven years of famine. See, who controls that? Not man. God. So when a Christ believer in Mark 4, a man, that's the Christ believer, takes the Bible out into the world, 
He has done the work for which he has been called. He's not called upon then to make people believe it, because we can't. We can't make people believe the Bible. All we can do is tell them the Bible and leave the rest up to God. If we worry about it, if we fret about it, that's foolish. It's out of our control. We should be like the patient farmer, just waiting for the harvest. We sowed the seed. It's up to God now. We're just waiting for the harvest. It's useless for us to try to force people to believe or get into the church. Now, I know that a lot of churches would work that way, the the so-called church growth movement. Oh, pastors and synodical denominational leaders, they're, they're in their offices all day. How can we get more members? How can we get more money? And how can we build the church? And They fret about it. They worry about it. And they, they do what then? They think they can control it. By doing what? Yeah, we, we got we to gotta maybe change the message. This message ain't working. It's not bringing people in. We gotta, we gotta tell them something different. We gotta tell them what they wanna hear. We gotta give them more chili suppers or bake sales or, we, you know, we, we gotta come up with something different. This, this, this Bible thing, it ain't working. Well, that's like a farmer saying, my, my, my plants just aren't growing very well. I'm gonna go out and just, uh, I'm gonna do something to them. <laughs> but they end up spraying poison on them, you know, and killing them. Then you've lost the church altogether. But that's what you see when churches get all wrapped up in this numbers game. Oh, we've got to get more people. We've got to get more money. We, we've got to build a bigger building. We've got to do blah, 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 you know. It's up to God. He will build the true church at his own pace. That's what Jesus is teaching in this little parable. Where is the power of the church? Is it in our brains, our schemes, our plans? No, it's in the Bible. If we want to build the true church of God, it's in his word. The inspired scriptures of the prophets and apostles. And it rests with God to bless the proclamation of it. He only tells us, make sure you're spreading the true word. That's your job, period. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians for a moment. 1 Corinthians 3. where, of course, this is an epistle of the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He's writing the Word of God. But um, Oh, let's pick it up at uh, verse 4. He writes to the Corinthian church, For one saith, I am of Paul, and another one... I am of Apollos. And are ye not carnal? In other words, fleshly? You're not spiritual? What was going on in this Corinthian congregation that Paul would write this? Well, they're splitting up. They're, they're, They're splintering. You got some members of the church say, well, I'm following Paul. And then you got Apollos. He was an assistant of Paul who came after Paul and kind of held things together while Paul moved on to the next town. And they said, well, I'm of Apollos. I follow Apollos. And they all had their different pastors or whatever that they liked. And it was splintering the congregation. Like like the congregation belonged to its pastors. And they each picked out the one that they followed. And he calls this carnal. He calls this of their flesh. Now look at five. 
Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. What's he saying? Yeah. Paul didn't bring you to faith. Apollos didn't bring you to faith. All they did was bring the word of God to you. But you believed by what? Yeah, as the Lord gave. The Lord gave you your faith, the same Lord. Paul, Paulus, all the others, they're, they're just ministers. They're just servants of God, bringing you the word of God. And he goes on. Verse 6, I, meaning Paul, I planted, sound familiar? <laughs> like a farmer. What did he plant? God's word. God's word. He brought God's word to them. I planted, Apollos watered. What does that mean? Well, he came along and he, he kept it going with the same word. But God gave the increase. It wasn't me or Apollos that increased your faith or the, the church there. Go, to, go on to verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Isn't, isn't he saying the same thing here that Jesus is saying in this parable? Let's go on to the next verse. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandmen. Ye are God's building. What's husbandman? Or husbandry. What's husbandry? Ye are God's husbandry. Farm. You're God's farm. Not ours. God's the farmer. <laughs> He's the builder. Now, now we, we plant and we water. We bring the word of God. And we keep bringing the word of God. That's the watering. You know, we, we, that's our labor and we'll receive. You know, it's, a, it's a good thing to be. And, and God will reward us for that. Not that. It's not works righteousness, but that's just, you know, our reward is to see people come to faith. But that's not our doing. It's God's doing. And when you're converted and you, you come to faith, you're, you're totally changed. You're a new creature. All we did was sow it in the ground and God made it grow. It's his building. Okay, back to Mark 4. Verse 27, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. I don't, I don't know how God works conversion in a human soul. It's a mystery, it's a miracle. How do you take this, this enemy of God, this profane, unrepentant sinner, who thinks he knows it all, and hates God, and hates the Bible, and hates the church, and everything else, wants nothing to do with it, how do you change that person into a true Christ believer. That's a miracle. Now, I can't do it. But I know God can do it if I apply the means of grace to this person. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10. Okay. So anyway, the farmer goes out in the field, he sows the seed, and then night and day, night and day, night and day, night and day, Time goes by. Does he get up the next morning and go out in the field with his combine? <laughs> he might want to, but he don't. <laughs> it's not ready yet. It takes a lot of night and days. Well, same way with us. We sow the seed. We don't expect immediate results. But we know the results will be there as God Makes it happen. <clears throat> okay, so the, the farmer must patiently wait night and day, night and day. He, may, he waits a long time, months, for God to make the harvest come, Jesus says. How much can the farmer do to hurry it along? Nothing. He can't do anything. 
He's helpless. He doesn't know how. Many in the church have become impatient. And instead of waiting for the true word of God to do its work, they have lost faith in God's seed and sought to force growth by hybridizing the seed with human seed, which is man's human reason, tainted by sin. Tainted seed. He starts to change the word of God to make it more palatable for the unbelievers. Big mistake. You start doing that, you're not going to get a harvest. You're going to get nothing but weeds in your field. Flourishing weeds, maybe. Thousands of weeds, maybe, but just weeds. Man does not grow the church, is what Jesus is teaching here. Who grows the true, saved church? Only the Holy Ghost of God, right? Third person of the Trinity. In other words, don't try to improve on it by changing it. Changing the Bible, changing the Word of God, changing how God builds his church. Don't try to improve on it like well, I, I can help God out and give him a few suggestions here. He doesn't ask us to do that. In fact, he commands us not to do that. He says, here's the seed. Now you just go out and sow it. That's all you can do. Then God builds his kingdom, his church. Just sow good seed. As Paul wrote to the pastor Timothy in the New Testament, Preach the word. It's that simple. That's your job. Preach the word. Sow the seed. Leave the rest up to God. Shall we close with a benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.